Welcome, my dear students. We are beginning a new session, a new pharmacology session, and this session is going to discuss the various therapeutic aspects in the gastrointestinal system, in the GIT, that's the gastrointestinal system. When we speak of GIT from the pharmacology point of view, we are going to find out what are the drugs used for vomiting, what are the prokinetic drugs, we are going to find out what are the drugs useful for constipation, what are the drugs used for irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, we are going to discuss the anti-diarrheal agents, the anti-motility agents and of course we shall be discussing peptic ulcer disease. So let's begin with the discussion of GI or the gastrointestinal system with prokinetic agents. What are prokinetics? Pro is standing for something, is representing something, is helping or potentiating something. So prokinetic are the drugs which are going to stimulate the gut motor function. They are going to promote the gastrointestinal transit. They are going to increase the gastroesophageal sphincter tone. So that's your lower esophageal sphincter. And during our discussion, it will be abbreviated as LES, lower esophageal sphincter, that's gastroesophageal sphincter. Prokinetics will stimulate the gastric emptying by coordinated propulsive movement and the prokinetics could be anti-emetic drugs they could be D2 blocking, dopaminergic blocking agents or they could be the drugs which are useful in constipation and which are going to increase the gastric motility but when we speak of prokinetics we mostly restrict to the upper gastrointestinal tract the prokinetics are useful as anti-emetic drugs for symptomatic management of vomiting vomiting due to various causes. They are useful in the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease, what you abbreviate as GERD, GERD, or gastroesophageal, if you spell esophagus as OE, then it will be GERD, G-O-R-D. Non-ulcer dyspepsia, especially bloating, the gastric emptying abnormalities, and the epigastric pain might be associated. Then general anesthesia, vagotomy and diabetic gastroparesis these are some more indications and as I said if we go towards the bowel they will be useful in constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome and the drugs which will increase the motility will be useful and of course some other drugs which are useful in the management of constipation. We have a table here to show all the prokinetic drugs the left, left column tells you about the mechanism of action and the right column tells you about the drug and some salient features. You don't have to go on skimming through the various chapters. This table will bring you together as far as the prokinetics are concerned. Let's start discussing mainly D2 blockers or D2 antagonistic agents. They are prokinetic agents and they are anti-emetic agents one which crosses the blood brain barrier I have shown a right sign or correct sign here one which crosses the blood brain barrier is metoclopramide one which doesn't cross the blood brain barrier much is domperidon and I hope you know they are the commonly used anti-emetic agents so they are prokinetic main action is D2 blocking effect plus some other effects which we will discuss in the further discussion then the 5-HT3 antagonistic drugs, they are extremely important in the modern therapy of vomiting and those drugs are Ondansetron and Granicetron. What are these? They are the 5-HT3 antagonist and they are preferred agents to stop or to prevent the vomiting due to cancer chemotherapy. So they are very specific and they can be used to stop or prevent the vomiting due to cancer therapy. That's ondansetron and granicetron. Next, there are more drugs which are acting through the 5-HT receptors. Drugs which are 5-HT4 agonist and weak 5-HT3 antagonist, the two agents, cesapride and mosapride. Mosapride is being more frequently used these days and cesapride is banned in many countries due to its cardiac adverse effects. So cisapride, mosapride are also anti-emetics and they are prokinetics and they are 5-HT4 agonists and weak 5-HT3 antagonist. 
नेक्स्ट देर आर फाइव एच टी फोर पार्शल इग ऑनेस्ट सो इफ यू लुक एट दिस टेबल जस्ट टेक अ मूवमेंट टू टू हैव अ लुक एट द टेबल इफ यू आर एग ऑनेस्ट एट फाइव एच टी फोर रिसेप्टर यू कैन बी प्रोकाइनेटिक और एल्स यू हैव टू बी एन एंटोनेस्ट एट फाइव एच टी थ्री रिसेप्टर लुक हि ऑन डन सिट्रॉन ग्रानि सिट्रॉन फाइव एच टी थ्री एंटोनेस्ट सी सप्राइड मो सप्राइड फाइव एच टी थ्री एंटोनेस्ट एंड सी सप्राइड मो सप्राइड ऑल्सो हैव फाइव एच टी फोर एगोनेस्टिक इफेक्ट एंड दीज ड्रग्स ऑन द नेक्स्ट रो ऑल्सो हैव गॉट फाइव एच टी फोर एगोनेस्टिक इफेक्ट इट मीन्स इफ यू वॉन्ट टू हैव प्रो काइनेटिक इफेक्ट यू हैव टू बी इधर फाइव एच टी फोर एगोनेस्ट और यू हैव टू बी अ फाइव एच टी थ्री एंटोनेस्ट सो कंटिन्यू आर डिस्कशन फाइव एच टी फोर पार्शल एगोनेस्ट इज टेगस रोड एंड दिस टेगस रोड इज यूजफुल इन कॉन्स्टिपेशन प्रिडामिनेंट इरिटेबल पावर सिंड्रोम सो इट्स इरिटेबल पावर सिंड्रोम एंड द प्रिडामिनेंट मैनिफेस्टेशन इज कॉन्स्टिपेशन सो टेगस रोड विल बी प्रो खाइनेटिक एंड इट विल बी यूजफुल ऑन द नेक्स्ट रो दर इज अ न्यू एजेंट इज कॉल्ड क्लोराइड चैनल एक्टिवेटर इट एक्टिवेट्स द क्लोराइड चैनल एंड सीक्रेट्स क्लोराइड इन द इंटेस्टिनल ल्यूमेन एंड दिस इज गोइंग टू क्यूमुलेट वॉटर एंड इज गोइंग टू स्टिमुलेट द मोटिलिटी सो दैट्स ल्यूबी प्रोस्टॉन द लास्ट रो स्पीक्स अबाउट मैक्रोलेट्स एस्पेशली एरिथ्रोमाइसिन इफ यू रिमेंबर योर मैक्रोलेट चैप्टर Macrolides have got a novel action. They stimulate the motilin receptors in the gut, and motilin is a prokinetic agent. So macrolides will be prokinetics. Is it okay? Let's let's review this table. D2 blockers, metoclopramide, domperidone, commonly used anti-emetic agents. 5-HT3 antagonist, ondansetron, granisetron, preferred for vomiting due to cancer chemotherapy. 5-HT4 agonist and weak 5-HT3 antagonist, cisapride, mosapride. 5-HT4 partial agonist, tegaserod, useful for constipation predominant, irritable bowel syndrome. A new agent, lubiprostone, chloride channel activator, and the last one is macrolide, which stimulate the motilin receptor. Let's move further. Here's a comparison on this particular slide, on two slides showing you a table. comparing metoclopramide and domperidone because you can instantly have the review and you can differentiate how these two drugs are different from each other i said in the beginning metoclopramide crosses the blood brain barrier and domperidone does not cross the blood brain barrier we'll explore this fact later on this table then we go to the mechanism of action what's the mechanism of action metoclopramide is a d2 blocker and it acts on the chemo receptor trigger zone plus it acts on the gut domperidone is also a d2 blocker but it's more selective it also acts on the chemo receptor trigger zone and it acts on the gut is some question coming to your mind both the drugs are d2 blockers both the drugs are acting on the chemo receptor trigger zone but one drug crosses blood brain barrier and the other one doesn't cross blood brain barrier what does this mean This means you cross the blood brain barrier or you don't cross the blood brain barrier still you can act on chemo receptor trigger zone are you concentrating should i repeat my statement you cross the blood brain barrier or you don't cross the blood brain barrier still you can act on the chemo receptor trigger zone what's the implication what's the meaning of this sentence the meaning of this sentence is chemo receptor trigger zone ctz is located outside blood brain barrier or the blood brain barrier is deficient at chemo receptor trigger zone so if you want to act on chemo receptor trigger zone which is which plays major part in the production of vomiting then you don't have to cross the blood brain barrier it's not necessary so this cross not crossing of blood brain barrier by domperidone doesn't stop it from being a prokinetic agent because the ctz is located outside the blood brain barrier so metoclopramide domperidone both are d2 blockers both act on the ctz and gut and domperidone is little more selective at the d2 receptors now let's talk about the gut inside the gut metoclopramide has got some effects which are different from domperidone 
Metoclopramide acts as a 5-HT4 agonistic drug in the gut. So there is 5-HT4 agonism and therefore metoclopramide can increase the acetylcholine release in the smooth muscle of the GIT. So increased acetylcholine release in the smooth muscle of GIT produces acetylcholine like effect on the smooth muscle. And look, let's go to the other side. Here you see no ACH like effect. Domperidone lacks this effect. Domperidone does not have the acetylcholine like effect. Its main action will be dependent on the blocking of the D2 receptor. So it's also a peripheral D2 blocker or peripheral D2 antagonist. Let's come back to the left side of the column to metoclopramide. We said there's 5-HT4 agonism and there's increased acetylcholine release in the smooth muscle. What are the effects of this? The effects of this are there's increase in the LES tone, the stimulation of gastric emptying, the stimulation of peristaltic movement and there's stimulation of emptying of the upper gut. In addition, it relaxes the pyloric antrum and the duodenal cap. Given in very large doses, metoclopramide does have 5-HT3 antagonistic action. But whatever we are discussing the prokinetic effect, this action doesn't have a role because this action is produced only in large doses. Let's go to the other side for Domperidon. We said no acetylcholine-like effect. It's got peripheral D2 blocking mechanism and it acts mainly on the upper gastrointestinal tract, upper GIT. It also increases the LES tone. It also produces stimulation of the gastric emptying and it relaxes the pylorus and the first part of the duodenum. It leads to decrease in the gastroesophageal reflux. So this is how we differentiate between the mechanism of action of metoclopramide and domperidone as prokinetic drugs. Just to summarize this, once again, both are D2 blockers, but domperidone is little more selective. We are speaking about the CTZ. Both of them, they act on the gut. Metoclopramide has got 5-HT4 agonistic effect and stimulating acetylcholine release effect in the GIT. Domperidone does not have this 5-HT4 agonism or acetylcholine-like effect. It just acts as a peripheral D2 antagonistic drug. Let's continue the comparison by going to the next slide. The next slide is discussing about the adverse effects of metoclopramide and domperidone. Metoclopramide produces sedation, dizziness and restlessness. Look at that. Can you guess what's the reason for this? With domperidone, there's no sedation and there are decreased CRS adverse effects. Now we are exploring the fact that metoclopramide crosses blood-brain barrier and domperidone does not. So because metoclopramide is able to cross the blood-brain barrier and act on the central nervous system, it can produce some amount of sedation, dizziness and restlessness. Whereas with domperidone, you don't normally see the sedative effect and the central nervous system adverse effects are minimal. The next adverse effect of a prokinetic agent, just by common sense, a drug which is stimulating the gastric motility and stimulating the forward propulsion, if you give this drug in a large dose, obviously, is going to produce loose tools and diarrhea. So metoclopramide does produce it and domperidone also produces loose tools and in addition, it can produce some dryness of mouth. The next adverse effect of metoclopramide and domperidone is common and this common adverse effect is coming because these drugs are D2 blockers and let me remind you dopamine works as PIF prolactin inhibitory factor we are still going to some other system so I'll make use of this board and write for you dopamine is same as PIF What's PIF is prolactin inhibitory factor. 
prolactin inhibitory factors. So dopamine inhibits the secretion of prolactin. Now what are we going to do here? We are going to give a drug which is dopaminergic blocker. So you block the dopaminergic receptors. So it's as good as you are blocking the action of prolactin inhibitory factor. Its prolactin inhibitory factor is blocked. So it's inhibition of inhibition. This inhibition of inhibition leads to increase in the prolactin. And this is why whenever a drug is a D2 blocker, you are likely to get hyperprolactinemia. Hyperprolactinemia. Let's go back to the slide. So there's a common adverse effect of metoclopramide and domperidone. Hyperprolactinemia, galactoria, gynecomastia, impotence, and menstrual disturbances. So hyperprolactinemia, galactoria, gynecomastia, impotence, and menstrual disturbances. All the effect of D2 blocked or dopaminergic 2 receptor blocked. So that's important. We go to the next adverse effect. And if you see this table for metoclopramide, it's looking all red. And for Tom Peridon, it's written less. So, just an apparent view is telling you that there's something which is very severe produced by metoclopramide. What is this severe thing? Just now we spoke about dopaminergic blocker. So, if you're going to block the dopaminergic receptors, what you expect is the extra pyramidal reactions. I hope you know. In Parkinson, there's dopamine deficiency. So, this is a similar situation that you're going to block the dopaminergic receptors. So, the patient is going to get extra pyramidal reactions. This is produced by metoclopramide if the drug is continued for a long time or if you give it in large doses. Domperidone, this effect is very less and the reason is Domperidone does not cross the blood-brain barrier in significant amounts. So, the fact that metoclopramide crosses and Domperidone doesn't cross, we are nicely using the fact to apply our knowledge to come to an adverse effect. Metoclopramide produces extra pyramidal reactions due to D2 blocker and this is less with domperidone. What's the clinical implication of this? These extra pyramidal reactions are especially severe in the form of dystonia in children, in young children. And please remember this is why metoclopramide is contraindicated below 5 years of age. So if your patient is too young, don't go for metoclopramide, domperidone is safer. So that is the comparison between metoclopramide and domperidone. Next we move on to the drugs which are preferred to prevent vomiting due to cancer chemotherapy and these are ondansetron, granicetron and dolacetron. What's this anti-cancer drugs and vomiting? What's the reason? Let's understand the pathophysiology. The anti-cancer drugs, many of them have got a capacity, have got a potential to release 5-hydroxytryptamine from the enterochromaffin cells in the gut mucosa. They release 5-hydroxytryptamine and when there is release of 5-hydroxytryptamine, this could be the cause of vomiting. Because these particular cells in the gut mucosa, they contain 80% of serotonin inside the body. And this serotonin which is released is going to act on the 5-HT3 receptors and this is going to work as having emetic effect and the patient is going to get vomiting. So many anti-cancer drugs produce vomiting. Have a look at the list. It's all red. I've done it red. It means that these drugs are more susceptible to produce vomiting. Number one, the most important candidate is cisplatin. Cisplatin produces very severe vomiting. Then you have alkylating agents like meclorethamine. You also have dacarbazine. Then you have carmustin. Again, one more alkylating agent is cyclophosphamide. Then you have some antibiotic, anti-cancer antibiotics. That's atriamycin. With cisplatin, you also have carboplatin. But cisplatin is more susceptible to produce vomiting. Carboplatin, little less, but yes, it's a potent emetic agent. And the last one is asparaginase. So, this is a list of anti-cancer drugs more likely to produce vomiting. We go to the next slide. 
with on densetron granisetron and tolacetron they are selective 5ht3 antagonist we already decided you have to be 5ht4 agonist or 5ht3 antagonist so these are 5ht3 blockers they act on the git as well as on the ctz and they are preferred for prevention of vomiting due to cancer chemotherapy for your reminder i have written in the bracket cisplatin they are also useful to prevent vomiting due to radiotherapy the adverse effects of ondansetron granisetron etc are constipation headache and epigastric distress let's go further to discuss two more agents prokinetics is cisapride and mosapride with cisapride and mosapride there is no d2 blocker they are not d2 blockers they have a different mechanism what's the mechanism they are both 5ht4 agonist and weak 5ht3 antagonist they increase the motility throughout the git they are prokinetic agents they stimulate the gastric emptying they stimulate the acetylcholine release also from the gi smooth muscle but the problem with cisapride was it prolongs the qt interval due to the prolongation of qt interval you get torsed day point arrhythmia and the drug proves to be cardiotoxic this particular adverse effect was reported and it was very severe in some patients especially when you give cisapride with cytochrome p450 enzyme system inhibitors then what's going to happen is have a look at the slide cytochrome p450 inhibitors when they are given what's going to happen is cisapride will not be adequately metabolized and then the prolongation of qt interval and the torsed day point arrhythmia is likely to be a more common adverse effect so cisapride can be cardiotoxic this is important to remember cisapride doesn't produce the extra pyramidal symptoms it doesn't produce galactoria or it doesn't produce cns depression it is banned in many countries due to the cardiotoxicity so what do we have we have mosapride it's a cisapride container and it doesn't produce any qt prolongation and there is no arrhythmia so if at all you want to use a drug from this group now you'll have a option of using mosapride look at this slide it's telling you something interesting about cisapride no cns depression no d2 antagonism no d2 blocking effect no action on the chemoreceptor trigger zone no extra pyramidal adverse effects no hyperprolactinemia galactoria i hope you are looking at the slide look at that no 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 cns depression no d2 antagonism no chemoreceptor trigger zone action no extra pyramidal symptoms no hyperprolactinemia or galactoria but the only problem is cardiac arrhythmia and just because of cardiac arrhythmia this drug which is acting by novel mechanism we have to discard the drug anyway we have mosapride instead of cisapride next agent is a 5ht4 partial agonist and that's called tegacerod this is a 5ht4 agonist increases or stimulates the gastric emptying does not have 5ht3 action or d2 action there is no effect on the les tone but it acts by increasing the colonic chloride and water secretion due to its 5ht4 agonistic effect and this leads to increase in the colonic motility so tegacerod is for constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome unfortunately tegacerod also has reported certain adverse effects due to which in some countries tegacerod is not used the next new drug is chloride channel activator that's a new mechanism and that's lubiprostone it is useful in chronic constipation and it stimulates the chloride channel opening in the intestine so what happens is there is increased chloride secretion and this increase in the liquid secretion this liquid secretion is going to stimulate the intestine and it shortens the intestinal transit time so that's about lubiprostan next obviously macrolide antibiotics that's erythromycin 
stimulates the motilin receptor on the GI smooth muscle and motilin secreted by the enterochromaffin cells is a prokinetic agent so it will act like motilin and erythromycin is useful for diabetic gastroparesis to regulate the gastrointestinal motility to regulate the gastric motility however you cannot use erythromycin for a long time for a long time because there is tolerance on chronic use so that's a novel action of erythromycin stimulating motilin receptors which could be useful in diabetic gastroparesis we have various forms of vomiting on the two slides motion sickness you go for hyosin that's scopolamine or you go for cinerizine, cyclizine, diamine, hydrinate and promethazine these are all antihistamines some of them are the phenothiazines like promethazine drug induced vomiting metoclopramide or again phenothiazine opioid induced vomiting response to anti-motion sickness drugs please remember this opioid induced vomiting response to anti-motion sickness drugs that's once again hyosin and all the drugs which we have mentioned on the first row the next row cytotoxic drug induced vomiting that's cancer chemotherapy induced vomiting yes on dancetron granicetron plus you can think of using corticosteroids dexamethasone plus you can think of using lorazepam a sedative hypnotic is useful metoclopramide is useful in the mild uh, vomiting due to cancer chemotherapy and nabilon a marijuana related drug is useful sometimes in cytotoxic drug induced vomiting we go to the next slide to have a look at some more forms of vomiting vomiting after general anesthesia yes you can think of using metoclopramide ondansetron is useful here also and sometimes an antipsychotic agent and that's haloperidol and promethazine vomiting in pregnancy especially 10 to 14 weeks H1 blockers, H1 antihistamines can be used or promethazine can be used and a very specific agent which is useful in hyper MSS gravitorum is pyridoxine or vitamin B6. Lastly, we discuss about vertigo. For vertigo, usually anticholinergic antihistamines like cyclizine and prochlorpyrazine are used or beta histine, histamine analog. Look at this important. It improves the blood circulation to the inner ear, beta histine. This is useful in many a disease and you can use a new weak calcium channel blocking antihistamine agent that cinerizine or along with it flunarizine is useful for vertigo. So this completes the discussion of prokinetic agents as well as the anti-emetic agents. On a new session, we will discuss the rest of the part of the gastrointestinal tract. Thank you so much.